Welcome to Community Resources. Today on our show, we are going to be talking about a very current issue in regards to addiction and some of the problems that we're having in the community. We've previously talked about our resource, the Team Coordinating Agency, and today I have two of my guests, Kim Boisel from TCA, as sometimes people call it. It is Team Coordinating Agency, and Jonathan Miller as well. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the services that your agency provides, and some of the things that I think that we're all seeing in the community that are happening recently, people might be reading about in the newspaper or hearing about on the news, um, very concerning in regard to some addiction issues, specifically heroin. Um, so this is a topic that is touching families and the community in general, um, and all of us as providers and people that are reaching out, providing social work, therapeutic services, um, are seeing a huge impact um, for everybody. So Kim, if you don't mind talking a little bit about your program that you're directing at TCA, Teen Coordinating Agency. My program is the Structured Outpatient Addictions Program, and we actually have two programs, one during the day for adults, and, and then we have an afternoon program for teens that's ages 12 to 18, roughly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's a, both programs are similar and set up that uh, group therapy is kind of the bulk of the program, but they also receive individual therapy, case management, we do drug testing and also go to 12-step meetings as part of the program as well. Mm -hmm. are, are some of your programs voluntary and some mandated? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, no treatment is mandated, but we do get a lot of referrals from the courts or from other people that maybe have some leverage over the client, but it's all mm -hmm. voluntary. Okay. Um, but probably our biggest referral source are, are the courts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jonathan, you're providing some of those additional mental health services, case management. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about those services? Yes. Uh, many of the folks who come to us for substance abuse treatment also come with concurrent mental illnesses of, of different kinds. It can be depression, it can be post-traumatic stress disorder, it can be attention deficit disorder or bipolar disorder. And in order to, to get a, uh, help people get a good outcome, uh, we have to treat both things at the same time. And that can be very challenging uh, with a group of people who have a number of things going on. So people will come with a substance use disorder, a mental illness, often some chronic physical illnesses that may be the result of the substance abuse. Mm -hmm. And also they, they often come with, with um, complaining of chronic widespread physical pain. So this all comes together. And how do we treat something that's very complex that is, tends to be chronic and relapsing with a lot of folks, especially the folks who come to a clinic for treatment? Right. So how do we, you know, so how do we do that? And that's um, that's what the, the clinic does, the, mm -hmm. uh, the outpatient clinic part of the organization. Kim's program doesn't have any mandated clients. Uh, we have other programs that do. For example, we have uh, contracts with the Federal Bureau of Prisons. With the for, and those are for federal prisoners who are within six months of release. After they are released, we have. Um, um, other contracts with the United States courts for, for folks on supervised release after incarceration. We also have a, a re-entry program with the uh, Massachusetts Parole Board, and the staff for that are located at the Parole Board in Lawrence. So we, you know, we work with a combination of people who come in just asking for treatment, uh, who have to come as, as part of a, a court mandate, we mm -hmm. also do dr drunk driver programs, I forgot that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and people across the lifespan from, from you know, young adolescents to older people. Uh, so we're, we're treating a, a, a wide range of people in terms of their age and in terms of their presenting issues. Now, I know that um, working with the Department of Children and Families, as I do, I'm a social worker there and have been for 14 years. I'm a licensed social worker in the state of Mass. 
um, we're seeing so much of an increase in the impact that substance abuse, addiction, specifically heroin, I think these days is having an impact. Our families, our children are losing their moms, they're losing their dads. Um, this is impacting the entire family. It's affecting our entire community. There are things that may be happening down the street from where you live. Um, it affects, I think, all of us. I think all of us can say at some point in time in our own families and circles of friends that we know someone that's going through some of these difficulties. And I'm curious as to what you're seeing the impact and the increased numbers and the people that you're trying to reach out to and help recently with some of these specific things with addiction and heroin. Definitely heroin is one of the biggest drug problems in Haverhill. Mm -hmm. We were talking about this earlier. Um, I think about half of our population are opiate addicts, yeah. and it's probably number one or number two with alcohol as mm -hmm. far as what are the most common drugs that we see in our program. Mm -hmm. um, and you talked about family issues. We see, sometimes we'll see um, a brother, a mother, a father, a child, all, you know, not, maybe not all at the same time, but it is a, definitely a family disease. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it is a big problem in Hebrew right now. Yeah and surrounding towns, Methuen, Lawrence, Salem. Right. It's a big right. problem right now. Yeah, I mean, all the way down to Taunton. I yeah. know that there's been some town meetings, and you know, I would love to see something like that take mm -hmm. place locally. I think that we're, uh, all of us mm -hmm. in the community that work mm -hmm. and care about the community are mm -hmm. seeing some need for some of this right now. Yeah. Jonathan, if you've you know, got some issues in regards to people that are being released, working with the courts as well, um, we may be seeing more of, of an increase in that mm -hmm. as well. I don't know if, if you're seeing some of those numbers increase. It, it, it varies. It, t it tends to come and go. Mm -hmm. um, when, mm -hmm. we do, when we work with the Federal Bureau of Prisons and the U.S. courts, those are federal cases, not state cases. And um, what we see are, are uh, people often uh, pleading to charges or being convicted in groups and they will go into jail as as a group and mm -hmm. then a few years later come out pretty much as a group so we see our our caseloads going up and down that way right and some um, of them have been yeah. sober for a while yeah. but maybe yeah. they were abusing heroin before yeah. they went in they could have right. been in for five right. or ten years even mm -hmm. some of the people we see right. we, we also yeah. provide another a forensic service, which is uh, the adult court clinics, not for children, but the adult court clinics for the Department of Mental Health Northeast area. So uh, as part of, uh, you know, the uh, adult court clinics do things like um, um, examine for competency to stand trial and criminal responsibility and involuntary hospitalizations, but we also do um, Section 35 commitment examinations for the court. Um, so we see a lot of folks coming through the court system who are struggling in treatment or don't want to go into treatment and yet have become a danger to themselves mm -hmm. or perhaps other people. And, and, um, and that's the, the, there are a significant number of those folks who, who come through our, our system. There's mm -hmm. been um, a, a shift, I think, um, within addiction and substance abuse treatment. Um, we're taking the approach of meeting people where they're at. Can each one of you speak a little bit about that? Um, I think it's much more gone to harm reduction. Um, if you can explain a little bit about that. Sometimes people think that by reaching out to help uh, and going to someone and a resource in the community means complete abstinence. Of course, I think everybody in a person's life that is addicted to any substance would like to see that. Um, but I think that the fear around some of those issues or withdrawals, I think that um, we're learning a lot more about how to successfully treat and work on people's strengths. If you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, it, is, it does tend to be a chronic and relapsing condition with mm -hmm. the folks who come to see us. When you, when you step back and you look at, at substance abuse over the entire country, we think, and there are no really good numbers on this, but those of us who work in the field think that at any one point in time, the, the prevalence of substance abuse is about 10%. About one in 10 people 
at any point in time are going to meet the, the, the diagnostic and statistical manual, the DSM criteria yeah. for substance abuse treatment, for sub excuse me, for substance abuse. But we also think the vast majority of those folks, maybe up to 90% or so, get better either on their own or just by using AA or some other self-help group mm -hmm. for just for a while. And for those folks, addiction is just an addiction. There's nothing else complicating it, and they have a vast majority of people. The folks who come to see us are different, and they're different than the ways I, I explained earlier. You know, they, they come in with a substance use disorder, a men one or more mental illnesses, some chronic physical illnesses, and, and often uh, complaining of a pain, physical pain that doesn't stop. So they're different from, from these right. other folks. And um, you know, these, are the, these folks are, are a challenge often to, to, you know, to help along and to, to, to treat. They don't want to be there. You know, the, the, their motivation is fleeting in the, in the beginning, and they don't want to be there. And Kim and, and I and the rest of the staff work to make coming to us a comfortable experience. Right. It's chronic and it's relapsing. Nobody gets a hundred on that test every time. Yeah. You know, I, I often will. You know, people will come to me, and I because I still do some clinical work. You know, and I'll work with somebody, and they'll they'll be abstinent for a long time, and then they will relapse, and they'll say, "I'm a failure. I, I don't. Just, I'm not worth anything. I, I just I couldn't keep doing. You know, I I, I failed again." And I'll sit there, and sometimes I'll, I'll take out a calculator, and I'll, I'll figure out with them, over the last year, you know, how, how often have you used drugs, and how often have you been abstinent? And often it comes out to something like they've been abstinent 95 to 98 percent of the time. I'll say, okay, so you're in school. You take a test, and you get a 98. What's your grade? Grade's an A. It's actually an A plus if you, yeah. you know, if they use yeah. pluses and minuses. So how does that A plus turn into an F here? Mm. Because you, you know, you, it's chronic and it's relapsing and it's going to, it, it tends to come back and it'll come back one, you know, more than once. And what we try to do is we try to get those periods of abstinence to get longer and more productive and the periods of, of relapse to get shorter and less destructive than they, than they used to be. Yeah. And that's a combination of, of the right program at the right time, the right intensity of services. Also, folks often need medication, medication for the mental illnesses they come in with, uh, antidepressants for, um, for depression, mood stabilizers for bipolar disorder, um, stimulants for ADHD, for attention deficit disorder, and also, for, especially for opiate addicts, medication for the opiate addiction, mm -hmm. which can be methadone, suboxone, or, or an, an injectable form of naltrexone called Vivitrol. And, you know, we, we provide Vivitrol at, 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 our, um, at our organization. And we um, have close relationships with, with methadone clinics also. Um, it's not one size fits all. Right. It's, it's, cho it's helping people choose the right approach for, for themselves at the right time and often involve their families if they're, they're willing to allow us to do that. Well, and I think the work that we do at the Department of Children and Families, it's, it's a whole picture. And it's, we try to do as long of a picture as we can, but probably be involved in somebody's life the least amount that we can, um, but to be successful in helping. Um, I think that there's some new things happening in regards to, you mentioned some medications. There are some things I think that are happening in the community that a lot of people are not familiar with, which I believe is Narcan. Um, this is something that is um, working, not working. I, you know, I, I think it's so new that we're all still trying to figure out some of these pieces. Uh, overdose is a big 
problem right, right now. And that right. is another yes. part of harm reduction for us is yeah. how to increase safety for people. Yeah. Obviously, we would like everybody to not use drugs. Right. But <laughs> yep. as yeah. John said, yeah. it is a chronic and relapsing condition. So right. we address relapse as part of treatment. And part of that is teaching people about overdose prevention. So we do trainings on a regular basis, and it's part of treatment. And we also bring outside people in to do trainings on overdose prevention, and Narcan is part of it. Mm -hmm. So anybody who comes to SOAP will be trained probably multiple times about Narcan and overdose. So they will mm -hmm. be offered Narcan. And we have offered it to the community as well. We've been working with the police department on getting Narcan and all the cruisers. Mm -hmm. um, the ambulances have it. They have a different version of it that's a little stronger. Yep. What we have is, is a, a nasal spray, so it brings people out more gradually if they have an overdose to opiates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, the majority of people coming in that have opiate addictions recently have had a recent overdose or have had multiple overdoses. Yep. So it's a big problem right now. Well, and y you talk about the harm reduction mm -hmm. and people being as safe as they can you know from a child protection perspective this is who else is in your home while you are participating in this behavior and going through your recovery your addiction your relapse um, and those safety plans uh, you know who's going to get a phone call so that the children are taken care of um, how are you going to be able to reduce your um, your harm to yourself and reduce the harm to your children in your home or the other people in your home. Um, so I know that this is part of the work that you folks also do in creating relapse plans and safety plans. Um, Jonathan, you know, the work that you're doing as well. Even if a person has maintained sobriety for a great period of time, there could be additional traumas, sure. like you're talking about the post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, are either of you seeing younger age um, in your population and the treatment for younger aged um, people having these issues? Our adolescent program is busier right now than it's ever yeah. been. And we are seeing a lot younger people with opiate addictions, so more severe yeah. drugs. It used to be heroin, I mean, it used to be alcohol. marijuana, maybe some pills and some alcohol, but mm -hmm. now it's really increasing. Yeah. More dangerous drugs, more chronic use. Um, and, yeah. right, and, it's, mm -hmm. and it's been, uh, you know, there's been a sharp rise recently in, in deaths from overdose r with mm -hmm. heroin, and it, it, it appears that uh, a lot of heroin on the street now is being mixed with a, um, a synthetic opiate called, called uh, fentanyl, mm -hmm. which uh, is very much more uh, potent than morphine and can cause death very quickly in somebody who, who is, has not accommodated to it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I don't know why that, that is, but yeah. uh, you know, fentanyl is what is used in duragesic pain patches for people who have cancer pain. Mm -hmm. um, and those, they, they cut them up and they get the gel out and they mix it with the, with the heroin. Yeah, I um, also yeah. do um, emergency response yeah. for the Department of Children and Families. Yeah. And I think, you know, between the police departments, our emergency rooms, our families, it, it really has just increased so dramatically in the last six months to 12 months. Um, you know, this affects child protection, yeah. Yeah. it affects the community, it yeah. affects the criminal element, it affects the police departments, um, all of our children our adolescents. Um, so this is such a complex issue for people to break down some barriers that are suffering and going through some of the addiction and withdrawal or participating in the criminal aspect of it. Um, you know, reaching out, what would be your, um, you know, if you could say to somebody out there that truly is in need, what would be the thing that we would say to them in regards to seeking help? Um, well, they can call us and yeah. we can help them either at our agency yeah. or with referrals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think you put the phone number at the end. And also it will run at the yeah. end, yes. I want to let people know too that they can call Greater Lawrence Family Health Center in Lawrence. And the Narcan program is available to anybody in the community. So if you have a family member who's struggling with opiate addiction, you can call them up or walk in 
and it's about a 30 minute training and you can leave with Narcan that day and it can save a lot of lives. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's important. That people and family know members could actually do that. Yep, you know, I mean, we're talking about husbands yep. and, and wives yep. uh, with their spouses, yep. parents that their children, you know, one of the things that I do at the department is when a child does come into the care and custody of the department because of safety issues and the child not being safe at home, there's a lot of family that usually gets right on the phone or comes directly to our office and says, please do not let my grandchild or my niece or my nephew or um, you know, a family member go into foster care and I do a piece that's called kinship. And we vet that home the same way that we do a foster home. Um, most of my kinship applicants that come forward are grandparents. So um, I'm seeing the complexity of a parent of an adult child mm -hmm. that has overdosed, mm -hmm. that has gone to the hospital on an emergency basis, and there was nobody at that moment within the first hour to three hours of whatever the emergency response was for that person, um, those children come into care and then we're working with them. And this is a parent that has an adult child going through addiction and they come forward and take care of their grandchildren. And that is such a difficult, complex mm -hmm. situation. Yeah, you know, I think that parents in general love their children um, and want their children to be safe. And even though this may be years of addiction or mm -hmm. years of conflict or difficulties within a family structure, I think it's pretty important and powerful for parents to know that that's a possible option. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that they can attend a training in they Lawrence? They can just walk in and have an individual meeting as well. They okay. don't have to sign up for a training. They can just walk in there. Let the, or call, make an appointment if they want, mm -hmm. walk in, and they just meet with somebody in that department, and they would do about a, 30 minutes at the most training where they just learn about how to recognize an overdose, and how to give rescue breathing, mm -hmm. and how to administer the Narcan. And it's very safe. If, if you think somebody's overdosing on an opiate, which is what Narcan is for, yeah. and it ends up they're not, it, maybe it was heroin, I mean cocaine or something else, it's not going to hurt them. Okay. So it is very safe, um, but it really saves lives. Mm -hmm. The one problem that they're having recently is um, the heroin that's out there that has the fentanyl in it yeah. is so strong that even the Narcan isn't enough sometimes. Right. But um, when you get the training, they give you actually two sets of spray. So you have to use both lately, mm -hmm. and, it, and that's yeah. just enough to get them through until the ambulance gets there, basically. Now, a lot so. of people may have concern, is there some way for a substance abusing individual to abuse Narcan? No. No, it's not okay. no, it's, it, it, no. it's not a narcotic. It's a okay. narcotic blocker. Okay. People confuse methadone with, with Narcan or now Exactly, and because this is something so sense. new, I right. wanted the community right. to know right. and hear right. that, um, and right. you know, right. we're not saying right. that parents are responsible for their children in this way. Everybody it's that's an, an adult, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's such a difficult yeah. and tough position mm -hmm. to be in or ask people to deal with. Yes. Um, and your agency is providing something for the entire family, right. for the children possibly, for the addiction yeah. and the person and for that's... the spouse. Exactly. You know, a lot of them are coming in for therapy to find out how to deal with it. Right. There's also Al-Anon, you know, and they can call yeah. us and we can give them referrals for all that as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And some of the other agencies, I mean, this is reaching as far out to our beach communities. I'm a little bit concerned that with the warm weather and the summer coming, um, we tend to see a huge flux between the beach mm -hmm. community and the warm weather. And sometimes mm -hmm. these numbers and these activities, I think, increase in the spring and summertime mm -hmm. of the year. Has that we common for really, you? With the chronic yeah. user, we don't see we don't a big see up and down with mm -hmm. the seasons. Mm -hmm. I think with alcohol, there is a, yeah. an increase yeah. in the warm weather, yeah. maybe more drinking and driving, yeah. Um, yeah. but not necessarily the opiate user. We don't really see a big no. change in the mm -hmm. seasons. Mm -hmm. um, this is more the chronic user, but I think we do see more alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. And the young people may be using a little bit more because they're not yeah. in school. So. Um, can you talk specifically about SOAP for your adolescent, um, mm -hmm. adolescent participants? Mm -hmm. 
Like I said, it's similar to the adult program, but it tends to be a little bit less severe user. Um, it depends. If we have somebody come in and they're abusing opiates and they're a teenager, some of those kids are not in school. So sometimes we will have them attend the adult program. If they're a more chronic user, they're mature, and they have more severe consequences, sometimes they identify better with the adult program. So we will talk to whoever they're involved with in their life, their parents, DCF, um, mm -hmm. and make that decision. Um, but for other people, they come after school. We also have some kids that are in um, Recovery High School. I don't know if you've probably heard of that. In Beverly? Yep. Yes. So we have some kids that go there, and that's a really great support for them, mm -hmm. or other alternative schools in the area, and then they come after school. And they have uh, two groups each night on different topics relating to how to um, develop their own relapse prevention plan, work on their anger management, dealing with authority, working on family supports, um, just how to cope with life without using drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and we do drug testing a couple times a week. We have family meetings for all the kids that come there, so working with their families on how to support them, making sure they're getting enough positive feedback as well, which tends to be a tough thing for right. families that are really struggling. They don't know how to help their kids, so uh, some, we give them support around that as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that um, I, in, in some of the work that I've done, I, I see something missing in the way of kind of support groups. Mm -hmm. I think that for, you know, all of the uh, mental health issues, the addiction, mm -hmm. the trauma, um, I don't think there's enough to support the people that are kind of taking care of all of these mm -hmm. people. Um, I didn't know if you folks have any support groups that are over at the team coordinating agency for people to participate in as well. We don't really have support groups that are not treatment groups, but we can refer people to them. I know at, um, I think they still have it at Leahy, they have the Al-Anon meeting and we mm -hmm. refer people to that because Al-Anon is really important if you have a family member who's in recovery or not in recovery, mm -hmm. who's still using, and you need support on how to deal with that. I think mm -hmm. Al-Anon is a great place to go, and you can be around other parents, family members going through the same thing, and know how to help yourself at the same time as helping your family member. It's mm -hmm. really important. So. And uh, Jonathan, if you can talk a little bit about <clears throat> when we're dealing with mental health issues, um, it's very mindful in regards to, like you said, the medication if a person is actually dealing with addiction as well. Mm -hmm. That, like you said, that's a very complex situation. Right, because it, you know the, the mental illness is often a, a separate and independent risk for substance abuse. Yeah. Um, when you look at the, the when you look at the, the the percentage of folks with mental illnesses who abuse drugs and alcohol, it's it's significantly higher than in the general population. Right. So they, they go together. Mm -hmm. And you can't look at it just one way. One way. You, you, you need to be doing both things at the same time. So, you know, in the old days we would say, ah, oh, you know, send them to, a, to an addiction treatment person and clean them up and then send them to a real therapist. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it didn't work. Right. Because you need to be able to do both, both things at the same time and also attend to their chronic medical illnesses. You know, often things like um, infectious hepatitis, um, sexually transmitted infections, um, there's a, often um, um, injection drug users uh, will get something called infective endocarditis. You know, the inside of their heart gets infected and it, and it damages the valves of their heart and, mm -hmm. and this, you know, makes for some lifelong issues for them. Um, so there are a lot of um, chronic, unrelenting medical illnesses that go along with the other things that they bring to the table when they, when they come to see us. A lot, so you, a lot yeah. of opiate addicts will yeah. start with chronic pain. Yes, chronic, some right. Some kind of injury. Right. Right. And right. they are prescribed right. a medication by their doctor and they right. become addicted to the medication. Right. Yes. Then they, they start abusing, right. maybe can't afford it, and progress to opiates. Right, especially, especially if they are, um, if it runs in their family and, mm -hmm. and they're predisposed to it for, for any number of different reasons. Um, you know, it's, it's not that you, you get a gene for, for um, you know, for addiction and, and that makes you an addict or not. You know, many genes come together. No, 
no one gene is necessary or sufficient to cause the addiction, but together with uh, the, the wrong environment, you're predisposed to, you know, to becoming addicted. Right. So, it, it, you know. Um, it's complicated. It's very complicated. You know, um, and there's, there's, no, there's no one answer for this. Right. You know, and, and what I like about the work that we do is we, we can do things around, um, um, yeah, we can, we can do things around um, um, helping people w with harm reduction, but it doesn't, but it doesn't work always. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't apply that to bank robbery or assault and battery, you know, that, uh, right. well, you, you robbed, you know, three less banks this week, but if you, but if you are abusing less substances less often, that's progress. That's well, we hope all of you reach out to the resources that we do have in the community. Team Coordinating, Coordinating Agency, TCA, is doing a lot of this work. Uh, they are located, what is your address on? 76 Winter Street. 76 April. Winter Street. Across from the YMCA. It's easy to remember. Perfect. Across <laughs> from the YMCA, if you didn't hear, Kim. Um, and there's much more work to be done in regards to this area, and we'll probably revisit this as well on another show in the future. Thank you very much for being here today, and we look forward to our next time meeting with you in the community.